Okay, so hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about posterior cerebral artery stroke syndromes. So before we go into it, we'll just have a short discussion on the anatomy. So we have the two vertebral arteries, the two vertebral arteries which are going to form the basilar artery. And the basilar artery is going to give several branches. We'll discuss about that in detail later on. But remember that the terminal branches of the basilar artery or the basilar artery is going to bifurcate into the two posterior cerebral arteries. It's going to bifurcate into the posterior cerebral arteries. And the posterior cerebral artery is connected to the internal carotid artery via the posterior communicating artery that is the PCOM. Okay, so the PCOM is going to connect the internal carotid artery to the posterior cerebral artery. So the part the part of the posterior cerebral artery that is proximal to the PCOM is known as the P1 segment and the part that is distal to the PCOM is known as the P2 segment. All right. Okay, so 75% of the population, the posterior cerebral artery is going to arise as a bifurcation of the basilar artery as we discussed earlier. But however, in 20% of the population, one of the posterior cerebral artery is going to come from the ipsilateral internal carotid artery via the posterior communicating artery. This is known as fetal origin of posterior cerebral artery. And in 5% of the cases, this uh, PCA which is going to arise from the ipsilateral internal carotid artery is going to do so bilaterally. So in those cases the P1 segment is atretic. Okay, now coming to the structures that are supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. So we'll just have a simplified diagram again of the PCA. So this is the basilar artery. It's going to bifurcate into the two posterior cerebral arteries. Okay, it's going to bifurcate into the two posterior cerebral arteries. Okay, so this is the basilar artery. This is the basilar artery and this is the posterior cerebral artery, the two posterior cerebral arteries. And then we have the PCOM which is going to connect the PCA to the internal carotid artery. So this is the PCOM. So the part that is proximal to the PCOM is known as a P1 segment and the part that is distal to the PCOM is known as a P2 segment. Okay. So from the P1 we are going to have lot of penetrating branches. From the P1 segment, we're going to have a lot of penetrating branches. Remember that these penetrating branches are going to supply the midbrain, the midbrain, the thalamus, the thalamus, and the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis. And the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis. So these are the three structures that are supplied by your P1 segment via the penetrating branches. So the midbrain, the thalamus and the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis. Okay. And then we have the P2 segment. So the P2 segment is predominantly going to give rise to the cortical branches. So it's going to supply the inframedial part of the temporal lobe, inframedial part of the temporal lobe as well as the occipital cortex. Okay, so remember the P1 segment is going to supply the midbrain, thalamus and subthalamic nucleus and the P2 segment is going to give rise to the cortical branches which is going to supply the inframedial part of the temporal lobe as well as the occipital cortex. Okay, so the P2 segment which is distal to the PCOM is going to supply the inframedial part of the temporal cortex and the occipital cortex. Okay, so what are the causes of occlusion? So just like for other uh, stroke syndromes, the most common causes are going to be embolism, atherosclerosis and additionally in the posterior circulation, remember that arterial dissection is also an important cause of stroke. Okay, now coming to the different PCA stroke syndromes. So now we'll talk about the P1 syndrome. So as we discussed earlier, the P1 is going to supply the midbrain, thalamus and the subthalamic nucleus. So now we'll go into the midbrain syndromes. Okay, so this is a cross section of the midbrain at the level of the superior colliculus. So here you can see this is the third cranial nerve nucleus. This is the third cranial nerve nucleus. So it's going to give rise to your third cranial nerve fibers. It's going to give rise to your third cranial nerve fibers. Okay. So this red part over here is known as a red nucleus. This is a red nucleus and the part over here, this is known as a crust cerebri or the cerebral peduncles. So this part is what is going to have your corticospinal tracts, both your corticospinal tracts as well as your corticobulbar fibers. Both of them are going to be present in the crust cerebri. And then you have the red nucleus and then you have the third nerve nucleus. So what are the important midbrain syndromes? So let's say we're going to have an infarct over here. Okay, I'm shading this part. Let's say we have an infarct over here. So what's going to get affected? So number one, your third cranial nerve fibers, your ipsilateral third cranial nerve fibers are going to get involved. So you're going to have an ipsilateral element type of third cranial nerve palsy, an ipsilateral third cranial nerve palsy and also your 
corticospinal tract is involved okay since your crest cerebra is also infarcted over here your corticospinal fibers are going to get involved and remember that the corticospinal fibers are going to cross in only in the medulla okay so you're going to have contralateral hemiplegia you're going to have contralateral hemiplegia so the name of this syndrome is known as weber syndrome this is known as weber syndrome Okay, now come to the other important brainstem syndrome. Okay, let's say that you have an infarct over here. You have an infarct involving this part over here. I've shaded it over here. So, what are the structures that are involved over here? So, number one, just like the previous syndrome, your third cranial nerve fibers are involved over here. So, again, you're going to have an ipsilateral element type of third cranial nerve palsy. Okay, now over here, since your red nucleus is involved, you're going to have contralateral ataxia. You're going to have contralateral ataxia as well as tremors. So this is known as Claude syndrome. This is known as Claude syndrome. So these are the two important uh, midbrain syndromes. And remember, a combination of Weber syndrome, a combination of Weber syndrome as well as Claude syndrome is what is known as Benedict syndrome. This is known as Benedict syndrome. So all of these three important midbrain syndromes are very, very important MCQ questions. So let's recap this. So uh, midbrain syndromes are Weber syndrome where you have ipsilateral third nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia. Claude syndrome where we have ipsilateral uh, element third nerve palsy with contralateral ataxia and tremor because of involvement of the red nucleus as well as the dentato rubrothalamic fibers. And then Benedict syndrome is a combination of both Weber and Claude. So you're going to have your ipsilateral third nerve palsy, contralateral ataxia and tremors as well as contralateral hemiplegia. Okay. Now coming to the other issues with P1 stroke syndromes. So as you know, it's going to supply a subthalamic nucleus of Lewis. So you're going to have contralateral hemibolismus. Contralateral hemibolismus. And because of thalamic infarction, acutely the patient is going to have contralateral hemisensory loss. And in the chronic stage, the patient is going to have severe contralateral agonizing burning pain. So this is known as degerin rossi syndrome. And in case of artery of percheron occlusion. So usually what happens is uh, the P1 branches will arise bilaterally and will supply structures bilaterally. But sometimes what happens is they join together to form a single branch to supply all the P1 structures. So this is known as artery of percheron. This causes upward gaze palsy, drowsiness and abulia. So mainly patients going to present with altered sensorium and decreased uh, level of consciousness. Okay, so this is artery of percheron occlusion. It's an important MCQ question. Okay, now coming to the P2 syndrome. So as I discussed earlier, P2, uh, P2 segment is going to supply your temporal cortex as well as your occipital cortex. So you're going to have contralateral homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing. So why do you have macular sparing over here? Because the macular, the occipital pole has dual blood supply. It is supplied both by your MCA as well as PCA. So since your MCA is still patent, you're going to have macular sparing. And because of temporal lobe involvement and hippocampal involvement, there's going to be an acute disturbance of memory, especially in dominant hemisphere involvement, especially in dominant hemisphere involvement. But however, this memory, uh, memory issues are usually not uh, permanent. Usually they resolve over a period of time. And very, very important, when the splenium of the corpus callosum is involved, you're going to get alexia without agraphia. So this is a very, very important MCQ question. Next, you're going to have pedunculaar hallucinosis, okay, where you're going to have visual hallucinations where there are brightly colored scenes and objects. The patient is able to visualize brightly colored scenes and objects. Now, coming to bilateral P2 syndromes. Okay, so bilateral P2 syndromes are usually rare. So, how it's going to present is patients are going to have cortical blindness, Anton syndrome. Okay, so Anton syndrome is where the patient is actually blind, but the patient is unaware or denies the blind presence of blind blindness. And the other Important syndrome is balance syndrome. Okay, so there are three important components of balance syndrome. Balance syndrome usually occurs when there is a middle cerebral artery and posterior cerebral artery uh, territory watershed infarct. So remember, watershed infarct usually occurs in where major arterial territories are going to meet. So in MCA, PCA, watershed infarct, you're going to get balance syndrome. So the first feature is palinopsia, where the patient is going to have a persistent of the persistence of visual image despite gazing at an other scene. Okay, so the visual image is going to persist for several minutes even though the patient is fixing on another scene. Next, asymultanoglossia, where the patient is unable to synthesize the whole of an image. And then optic ataxia. I think I've covered most of the important points. Thank you.